Good evening, and welcome to this Center for Brooklyn History talk. Tonight, two remarkable historians focus on the history of racism in America and the powerful ideas in the new book, White Fright, The Sexual Panic at the Heart of America's Racist History. Before introducing our guests, allow me to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about the Center for Brooklyn History. My name is Marcia Eli. I am the Director of Programs at the Center, which was formerly the Brooklyn Historical Society. As some of you know, a few months ago, BHS became a center of the Brooklyn Public Library. Now our combined collections of Brooklyn related materials truly make for the most extensive archive on Brooklyn in the world. And our public programs join the offerings the library brings you through the programming arm BPL Presents. I hope that you'll explore all that's coming up at BPL Presents, including the programs at the Center for Brooklyn History. In a minute, I have the honor of introducing tonight's conversationalists, historian Jane Daly and historian Nell Painter. But first, I want to tell you three quick things. One, I want to share that we will put in the chat a link to purchase White Fright locally, the community bookstore in support of Brooklyn's small businesses. Second, I want to mention that our very first CBH talk of the new year brings to our virtual stage Ijeoma Oluo, author of the book So You Want to Talk About Race. She will be discussing her new work titled Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America, which I think connects very powerfully to tonight's discussion. And I hope that we'll see some of you there. And finally, I wanna invite all of you to share your questions for Jane and Nell. Simply type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome White Fright author and Associate Professor of History at the University of Chicago, Jane Daly, and historian and visual artist, Nell Irvin Painter, Princeton University, Edwards Professor of American History Emerita, and the author of several books, including The History of White People and Southern History Across the Color Line, a new edition of which will be available in 2021. So I cannot thank you both enough for being here. Thank you so much. And now I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Marcia. Uh, it's so good to be back with the Brooklyn Historical Society, so to speak, uh, in your uh, new um, identity. Uh, Brooklyn is so important in American history. And I'm glad that the Brooklyn Historical Society is adding to the Brooklyn Library, which is also a storied institution. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, Black civil rights and sexuality and the fear of interracial sex among white Americans. The book we're talking about is White Fright. And here it is. This is Jane Daly's new book. Um, if you read the New York Times yesterday, you saw it reviewed very nicely. Thank you, Times. And um, this book is a take on the kind of approach to American history that Jane and I have both shared for a long time. Uh, Jane was my dissertation advisee at Princeton, um, one of my early ones and one of my most famous and productive. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to be here with you, Jane. White Fright is uh, in its heart about the fear of interracial sexuality. And it uh, starts in the 19th century with the Civil War and Reconstruction, goes through the various phases of the struggle for Black civil rights. And what you see at every point is a kind of white hysteria about Black sexuality. Actually, let me read the blurb that I um, wrote for this book. In White Fright, historian Jane Daly skillfully entangles the purposefully snarled concepts of sex, marriage, and politics at the foundation of 
of the white supremacist American political economy that followed reconstruction. More than a century and a half later, such gut level concepts underlie our current project politics, making white fright a central reading right now. As Daly shows, the history of anti-blackness is white history. So Jane, uh, you take us uh, from the 19th century uh, into um, 1967 with Loving. Um, can you tell us what Loving, uh, what the decision was and why it stands as an endpoint in your book? Thank you. Uh, let me just say uh, my thanks to uh, Brooklyn, <coughs> excuse me, Public Library. Um, Thank you, Marcia, it's lovely to be here. And I'm so thrilled and honored that my teacher, Nell Irvin Painter, could be my interlocutor, which I think is a wonderful thing. I am having flashbacks to my dissertation defense. Oh. <laughs> I, I will put them, I passed. You did, and brilliantly. Um, so yeah, let me, um, you put it so beautifully in the blurb where you said these things were purposefully you know, snarled. In, in Southern history and snarl is just the right word for, uh, for, for the South and loving, the loving decision um, is important for lots of different reasons. It was very important for the lovings and their family um, to have their marriage recognized by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1967. Um, but it, it, was, it was one of the only decisions, Supreme Court decisions in which uh, the justices spoke the words white supremacy. Uh -huh. Earl Warren says, this isn't about race purity. It's not about public health. It's not about anything else. It's about white supremacy. And we're gonna get rid of it. And we're gonna say that marriage is a fundamental freedom um, and a, a fundamental right of free citizens. He says, you know, free citizens decide who they're gonna marry all on their own without mm -hmm. the state telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah. So why so late? I mean, 1967, not in your lifetime, but in mine, and I'm still alive. Uh, what was the big deal? What was the big deal? Um, you know, the, people thought even in 1967 that uh, having a decision like this might spark, as they would put it, race war uh, by what they meant would be white massacres of black people. Uh, would social, you know, people in the streets shouting and, you know, fires, like, it didn't, it didn't happen. So in a, in a weird way, it should have happened much, much earlier. It's very late. It's true that it's at the tail end of the civil rights movement. And one of the questions I started with when I was writing this book was if, if one believed, as, as I did, that uh, interracial sex and anxieties about that were at the very core of Jim Crow, of this segregationist world of the Jim Crow South. Why was the loving decision last and not first? And that's kind of where I, where I started. Why did it take so long yeah. to the fundamentals? And it did take a long time. I want to ask you to talk about um, themes which are throughout your book. Um, you talk about it in the very beginning, you talk about it in the very end, but perhaps our audience may not focus on the distinction as at the same time as the blurring between inter, let's leave the definition of interracial aside for now, uh, interracial sex and interracial marriage. What's the difference? Well, um... Interracial marriage obviously is a, is a legal relationship. It's something that's very important uh, for property uh, transmission. There are people who say that the only thing about marriage really is about clear lines of the transmission of property. Uh, but that is one, you know, one big difference there is you're a family, you're legally married, you have certain rights uh, that the state gives you uh, when you do that. You have a license to get married. Um, Sex, sex you don't need a license for. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, 
So is the um, white hysteria around interracial um, relations focused on interracial sex or on interracial marriage or on both or on both differently or the same? Both differently. Uh, so I mean, one, of, one of the things that fascinated me at the very beginning of thinking about this was something that Eugene Genovese said and other historians have said as well, was that slave owners didn't spend all their time worried about protecting white racial purity, right? That you know, masters had sex with slave women um, and possibly slave boys. Um, women, surprise, surprise, white women had sex with slaves, um, white women had sex with free blacks. People had sex across the color line long before emancipation is the main point. Um, even though it was illegal most of that time, but it wasn't a panic, it wasn't a hysteria and it became one after emancipation. So when I say to your question, do people think about these things the same or differently? Um, the answer in some sense is both because after emancipation, whether it was sex or marriage, I think the focus for the kind of people very panicked were black black power, uh, not so much black sex, but uh -huh. but enfranchised black men, um, enfranchised people having their own lives, living their own lives, their own ways. When you talk about enfranchised people, um, did this kind of hysteria follow um, in 1920? when at least according to law, black women were allowed to vote. Did we get sexualized hysteria at that time or was the effective disfranchisement of black people, um, male and female, and of course black people in 1920 almost uh, uniformly lived in the South. So um, what about the enfranchisement of black women and the hysteria over interracial sex marriage? That's a really interesting question. Um, and you're, you're right, uh, there wasn't. There was, there was all kinds of, I think, opposition to what in the first place to women's suffrage, and here we are a hundred years later, mm -hmm. um, and also to the enfranchisement of black women. And in the South, as you know, people objected to women's suffrage in general because mm -hmm. they objected to black women's suffrage in particular. Yeah. Uh, but, but their objections were not couched uh, in terms of sexuality. They didn't say, if you give black women the vote, they're gonna run out there and marry white men. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said, you know, on the flip side. So they, no, wait, wait, Jane, stop for a second. Yes. Why am I laughing about that? Why does that seem so ridiculous? I well, mean, as you say it, it makes perfect sense logically, but right. You see what I mean? I do see what you mean. No, the the so-called logic of Jim yeah. Crow didn't work in reverse, um, although the justification for the laws did. So okay. if you look at the laws against interracial marriage, the argument standing behind it that made it constitutionally acceptable under the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. was to say there's no racial discrimination in these laws. White men can't marry black women. Black women can't marry white men. Everybody's the same. Everybody's equal. No one's being discriminated against. Mm -hmm. So when you say that's the logic, on the one hand, it's farcical. Yeah. On the other hand, it was in fact um, seen as a watertight argument. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, we've been talking about race, but what about color? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about Plessy, for instance. The reason that, um, that Plessy could sue for his rights was because he looked white. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, when we talk about women in particular and all the discussion about um, which women need to be protected and which women are, um, are attractive and feminine, we talk about race, but we also embed in that color. Did the um, sort of white hysteria about interracial sex have colorist overtones? Oh, well, I think, I don't recall people speaking in that term 
but I think no, they very, wouldn't have used that term. Right, but, but yes, you, I, I think I think so. In, in yeah. part, again, uh, because there's always this worry, the perennial worry in the South about who's who. You know, uh, one of the things that anti-miscegenation laws, the laws against you know restrictive marriage laws, did for white Southerners was make them feel like there were boundaries and you knew who people were and you knew who you were and you know who these other people were. And so I think that yes, colorism is, is certainly there in part for the people dancing on, you know, on the color line. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, uh, when you get into the 20th century, you talk about the Perez decision mm -hmm. and the question of mixed marriage. What's a mixed marriage? Well, they were a mixed marriage insofar as um, the, the bride, who was Andrea Paris, was Mexican-American, but considered white by law in California. So she was on the white side of the ledger. Um, yeah, and this is 20th century, isn't it? Oh yeah, this is 1940s. This is World yeah. War II, 19, 1948 decision from California. And her husband was African-American. And so that was considered a mixed marriage, even in the state of California, mm -hmm. which you know is not part of the Deep South. Last time mm -hmm. I checked, but yeah. had a perfectly functional anti-miscegenation law as late as 1948. Wow, yeah. um, our what, golden state now. My own state, yes. Yeah, yes. I do. What about um, Asian Americans when we're talking about California? Um, where do Asian Americans fit in? Um, in, in the panic over interracial sex and in the regulations and the legal regulations. That's really interesting. It's very, it's talk about snarled. Um, California does it to itself with all of these other categories, mm -hmm. um, but they were also considered not white. Um, mm -hmm. And part, part of what made it possible for the California Supreme Court to get rid of their anti-miscegenation law mm -hmm. was that California, uh, the Californians never defined white with any precision uh, because I think there were always so many new people in California and they were always having That's to decide, you know, are, are yeah. Armenians yeah. white? Yeah. Well, I don't know, yeah. um, you know, and uh, these famous cases of trying to decide these things and California never actually said what, what that was. So they, so their law was weaker. In some other places, but yes, yes, um, Asian, Asian Californians, Asian Americans um, have their own. Um, my colleague Matthew Briones at the University of Chicago wrote a wonderful book called uh, Jim, Jim and Jap Crow. Wow, talking about uh, about this discrimination in California. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. We're talking about interracial sex. And the question I want to ask you is not directly on that, but one of the chapters I really loved in your book was about William Terry Couch and what the Negro wants. Will you tell our audience who William Terry Couch was and what the Negro wants and why it was such, on the one hand, a ridiculous, well, snarl, but why it was so, so typical of its time. This is the 40s, the 1940s, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's yeah. during, during World War II. Mm -hmm. and, and William Terry Couch was the editor-in-chief of the University of North Carolina Press, which was, I think people say that the, it's the best press in the South yeah. um, and the closest thing to, to a homegrown New York press. And he... He was a very sophisticated man. He was very well educated. He was very interested in uh, all things African American. And he decided that he would publish this kind of think piece book. Um, and he would ask this, what he thought was a great spectrum of distinguished African Americans yeah. to, to write uh, what they thought what the Negro wanted. And that was gonna be the title of the book, what the Negro wants. And they were all gonna say what the Negro wants. And this was gonna be great. He's gonna publish this book. Everyone was gonna buy this book. And he was absolutely floored when, when the essays came back and it turned out that the Negro wanted what everybody else had. <laughs> Up to and including interracial marriage. 
if if that's what they wanted, fine, they should have that. And I mean, he's fascinating and I love him too because he's so open in his astonishment. That's and he sad. says to them, look, I've spent years telling people, black people don't want that. Yeah. Like he was personally affronted that anyone would say to him that they wanted to marry across the color line. And so it's really, and, and it wasn't like it was veiled either. You know, it all just said, and by the way, we want equal rights. And this yeah. is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Southern History Across the Color Line, uh, I spend a couple of essays talking about social equality which is a term that comes up in your book, but not as prominently as it does in mine. And the whole question about physical proximity and equality um, go together or don't go together in the phrase uh, social equality. And I think I, I want to use the term social equality to go to uh, one of the questions that's come from the audience which is, were interracial sex couples prosecuted for having sex before loving? Or was it only interracial couples who sought to marry? Uh, oh, good question. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's both. And there are some uh, very important legal cases in the run-up to the loving decision where the Supreme Court considers uh, laws against interracial adultery. Mm -hmm. um, one law, and there was a case in Florida, um, but but yes, people are prosecuted. People go to prison because they have married across the color line, or they're living with someone across uh -huh. the color line. You know, and there's a famous case from Alabama. Uh, you know, and these people don't just lose in court; they go to prison. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. and, you know, afterwards, in Mildred Loving, when when the Lovings are arrested um, in Virginia, they're legally married in Washington D.C but their marriage is not recognized in Virginia. Mm -hmm. When they're arrested, and they are arrested in the middle of the night, um, the sheriff keeps Mildred Loving there uh, for a week. A week? She's pregnant. She's oh. young. They put her in jail for a week. Yeah, wow. So the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, the, if the state found out you were doing this, yes, you could get arrested, yeah, whether you were married or not. Take you into their hands. Um, stepping into our very interesting year of 2020, do you see sex as prominent in US politics today? You know, when I look around, I see a lot of guns. Um, and I'm wondering if the gun is maybe kind of a phallic symbol uh, has taken the place of, of sex in uh, interracial hysteria and snarling. What do you think? That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see the sex question and, and I didn't see it either when President Obama uh, was elected. I thought in that election that I would hear a lot. Mm -hmm. of what did you expect to hear? I expected to hear the old, the old stuff. He's, you know, the black male rapist that you put a, you know, black man as president of the United States. That should have been um, just deadly to some people, and I think actually it was um, to more than we realized at the time. But I didn't hear that really when Obama was elected, and I did not hear that this summer. I didn't hear, you know, I didn't hear any echoes of the sexual argument this summer. Well, let's push that a little bit. Um, I talked about guns and penises. Uh, let's talk some more about guns and penises. Um, is it possible that um, sex hysteria has uh, transmuted itself into gun hysteria? Are, are there any similarities for you? Yeah, yeah that's, in, that's interesting. I see, I, I think I see what you're, what you're getting at in the sense, it is true, the hysteria about guns and this idea to protect the Second Amendment and they're coming to take our guns, you know, and you can say that that's anti-statist, that, that there's a long tradition of anti-federalism that would do that, but the emotional caliber of mm -hmm. they're coming for us uh, does kind of feel like other emotional 
that, you know, it has the kind of hysteria where you want to yeah. say to these white guys, you know, just calm down, you know, yeah. it's, it's all yeah. going to be okay. Yeah. You know, um, one of the questions that came to my mind as I was reading your book is about what, um, what historians have tried to do for decades, which is to reconcile Freud and Marx, to reconcile the sort of emotional kick of the psyche, and I put you on that side, with um, the calm uh, sort of uh, Bernie I concern for um, relations of class. Mm -hmm. um, am I right to put you firmly on the Freud side or do you have any marks in you in there? Oh, I think, well, I think I'm more on the Freud side, right? Yeah. I think, I think you are too, um, in that you've got both. Um, I've got both, yeah. And I'm not a communist. <laughs> tried, nobody's tried harder than you have, I think, in your scholarship to, to actually make those languages speak to each other um, and to try and explain both sides. But you're right yeah. that it's, it's not easy. No, it's not. And I think in our times, it's easy uh, to lose sight of Freud and to lose sight of just the, the gut level wrenching power of notions around sex. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one of the reasons the book is so important to remind us of that and to remind us of one of the most potent themes in US history. Uh, I see we have another question about biological or pseudoscientific arguments used in the US as they uh, were in Nazi Germany. That's a question. Were any biological or pseudoscientific arguments used in the US as they were in Nazi Germany, uh, I'm assuming uh, against uh, interracial sex. Before I turn it to you, let me just say that um, for me uh, in the history of white people, I don't talk about pseudoscientific arguments when I'm talking about the scientists and the scholars who were recognized uh, as scholars and scientists in their time, that racial science was the science of the 19th and 20th centuries. There is some pseudoscience, but much of it, and probably most of the mischief, came from scientists with good bona fides. Okay, so biological or scientific arguments in the US against interracial sex? Yes, uh, lots. Um, and as you put it so well, I mean, those, that was the science. That was respectable, you know, white man science, um, Harvard, Yale, Princeton science uh, in the 1920s and 1930s that shifts. And one of the wonderful things about the Paris case from California is reading the trial transcript, the uh -huh. back and forth between the, the judge, who was a wonderful man uh, named Roger Trainer, and the defense and the prosecution talking about this question. So the state says, oh, we need to have anti-miscegenation laws because science has shown us that, I think they say certain disharmonic results. Yes, that was the, that was the early 20th century. Yeah. yeah, occur when people have sex, you know, procreate across the color line and this is bad for everyone. And so this is 1948, right? So mm -hmm. after World War II and the judge interrupts the prosecutor and says, can you give me the name of one decent medical person who believes that today? And it was that moment of shifting. It was yeah. when that science in popular mind went from being science to being pseudo science. Um, and it shifted right in the 1940s and you can put your finger right on it. Uh, well, yes. we have the Nazis to thank for that, I think, uh, yes. for cleaning well, up science. I wouldn't give the Nazis so much credit for that. Um, I think actually, actually I wouldn't. Um, I think that the white supremacist arguments uh, outlasted the Nazis. And True. The Nazis didn't do anybody any any help. And there you have your your William Couch going nuts also in the 1940s saying, just because the Nazis believe in racial superiority doesn't mean we should all say we don't anymore. Yeah. He yeah. lost that round as well. Uh, but yes, the Nazis discredited it, but not to the extent that we might think. I think actually our own civil rights movement 
uh -huh. did a lot of that hard work after 1945. Yeah. 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 Another question. Do you consider the fight for marriage equality for LGBTQ communities an extension of the equality fight that led to loving or distinct in some ways? Well, again, both. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's distinct. I wouldn't I wouldn't think of it as an offshoot uh, or something like that. I guess you know these things are more organic. Um, than, than that. And I think that the struggle, certainly though, the struggle for same-sex marriage built on the legal foundation uh, mm -hmm. of loving. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember when, when the lawyers decided they wanted to bring that case, uh, a lot of people were worried and said, don't do that. It's too soon. Society is uh -huh. not ready for same-sex marriage. And if you lose before the Supreme Court, that will set the cause yeah. back. Yeah. Um, but they won, they won instead. Yeah, yeah. And uh, while we're still on loving, um, let's see, let me see if I can find this. Um, if interracial sex is at the heart of racism in Jim Crow, why wasn't there the same kind of quote unquote massive resistance to the loving decision as there was against Brown? And here we should say massive resistance is something from the mid 1950s and loving is 1967. That, that's a, a good question and, and one that I wondered about myself when I started the project. Because again, you know, now you've come all that way from reconstruction, you know, through the 50s, which does see tremendous pushback against sexualized pushback mm -hmm. against Brown. You'd think that when when the worst nightmare of white Southerners actually came true that people could marry across the color line, you'd think they'd go nuts. Yeah. And, and they didn't. And that was interesting. And it's, you know, I, I'm not sure I, I yet have a good enough answer for that. Mm -hmm. Partially it's that by that point in the civil rights movement so much, you know, it was after the Voting Rights Act, it was after the Civil Rights Act. It, it seemed like something that belonged in the bundle of rights that everyone was getting in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that doesn't explain what, where that feeling went. And I, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Well, another question may uh, feed into that. What was the role of the church, capital C church, religious organizations in general, in spreading a fear of black sexuality and interracial marriage? So religion and sex and race. Yes. I spent a lot of time on that in the book, um, more time than I ever thought I would have, <laughs> because it turned out to be uh, so important in so many different fronts. So I would say that um, white Protestantism in the South was a very important uh, pillar of white supremacy in the South. Uh, people made biblical arguments for white supremacy. They made biblical arguments against black equality um, all, all kinds of arguments. Um, but Southern Protestantism also was very helpful, and here's the part I think that is more familiar, mm -hmm. uh, to the proponents of civil rights. So to Martin Luther King, for example, um, preaching this sort of brotherhood Christianity, that was very important as well. So you can really see religion on both sides. One side as a trying to keep order um, in the name of God, and the other side saying, you know, we're, we're brothers, we're equals. Uh, let's see, uh, what about the link between guns being used to allegedly defend the honor and sexual purity of white women against black males? I'm not quite sure, um, where this is being situated? Like, is it in the current time or the 19th century or the early 20th century? Uh, but it's interesting because guns are so much a part of when we talk about white nationalism today, but not so much a part of what you and I studied as historians. No, it's, it's true. I mean, it, you, obviously if you're watching Birth of a Nation, you know, there's the endless scene with the men on horses, you know, coming yeah. in and they're armed. Uh, 
um, a lot yes. of them. So, so there is that scene, but no, I mean, guns, well, there, were, <laughs> there were gun laws um, actually, you know, in the 19th century. Yes, so, as there are now. Yes, but actually some, yes. Um, so I don't know. I don't know quite what to what to do with that question, except you could certainly, I think a lot of men see, and, and this was true for the free people, mm -hmm. they saw having a gun, having a rifle or a shotgun as something that was vital to defend their family. So yes. You could and see that part of their masculinity. Yes, very much so. But I think not as pronounced uh, a theme as it is in our discourse today. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that question really brings together different eras and the iconography of different eras, the sort of masculinist iconography of different eras, how we see um, nationalism, black nationalism and white nationalism mm -hmm. as uh, related to guns. Uh, you mentioned earlier that I'm from California. I'm from Oakland. From Oakland, and, uh, uh, the Panthers are were part of uh, my. I was never a Panther, but I knew Panthers, and certainly guns were a central part of the imagery uh, of masculinity for the Black Panthers. But I don't remember Panthers, Black Panthers, talking about uh, sexuality. Uh, in the same way as white nationalists did in the South in the 1960s. Uh, wow. that, would be, uh, that would be a question worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Certainly for the early 20th century, the uh, shying away from embracing uh, what was called social equality is on both sides of the color line. So in the early 20th century, Du Bois couldn't say, yeah, yeah, I'm for social equality because that seemed to say, um, I am not proud of being black. Right. That um, even entertaining the possibility of interracial marriage. I mean, you had to condemn interracial sex because it was abusive. Right. But for interracial marriage, to talk about that as, as something of a human right as occurred in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, that wasn't possible early in the 20th century, I don't think. Well, I think you're right that, that it was never at the top of anybody's articulated list. Although, again, I was surprised to find when, when people like Du Bois and others had their backs to the wall, they said, of course, I don't favor um, any laws against marriage. I think, you know, I think Du Bois would say, and lots of others, I really don't recommend it, but it shouldn't be against the law. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, certainly the, the, the parameters of racial pride really figure into questions about what are an individual's human rights? Because I think we think, and I think in the early 20th century, Americans would think of the freedom to marry whomever you wished as a human right, but you couldn't necessarily talk about it given the way that race was so important in public life. Race was kind of everything. I remember writing about Theodore Roosevelt, how he almost couldn't think of people without thinking of them as races. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned disharmonic um, relationships. In the early 20th century, that was an Italian marrying an Irish person. <laughs> <laughs> so the way we think about the categories of people have changed a great deal over time. Um, let's see, um, speaking of the 1960s, you entitle a chapter, Death Groans from a Dying System. Is there still such a thing as that same system? And is it still dying? Uh, yeah, 
and and that's something I thought a lot about this summer, actually. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. You know, I was thinking, by God, I'm publishing a book in 2020, and am I being optimistic to yes. think that yeah. you know, the white supremacist system was was slowly dying, you know, 50 years ago? Uh -huh. And so, yes, um, it's yes, it's it's the slowest death in recorded memory. Well, you know, I'm with you in using um, using that as a way to tie up a certain system of the relationship between black citizenship and white nationalism and white supremacy. As we've been talking uh, so far, that the salience of sex isn't the same now as it was a hundred years ago. We have some different salient notions like guns um, and maybe even the kind of cult-like nature of black of white nationalism um, in a way that I think I thought would have died out by now, but certainly has not. Um, but I, I must say that the events of this year, uh, such a tumultuous year, um, I start our year uh, in March, actually, when um, my husband and I fled uh, Liguria on the last plane from Genoa. Um, and then um, a coronavirus just took over our lives and the lives of millions of people around the world until the summer. I mean, it started again now, right. but after the, um, the death and the fear and the strictures and the panics of the spring, the summer brought this outpouring of righteous anger uh, over police brutality, over white supremacy, uh, this loud questioning of the icons of our public life uh, why are Confederates riding high in public spaces? I thought that was very encouraging. And I take that away from the middle part of this year. Mm -hmm. And I think the discussions that this middle part of this year have started really may um, make your last title true. Um, the dying groans. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't think of this year as pure horror. There's a lot of horror in this year and it's starting again, but I don't think of it as complete horror. Um, I, as you know, I went to art school and I, I do visual art now. I finally learned a way to put together um, the visual and the discursive uh, image and text. Um, and I look at the way the world is presented to me. I look at how the advertisements portray themselves and show themselves as virtuous and worthy of our money. And something that um, no longer astonishes me, but it did for a long time, was how many mixed couples I see selling us stuff. <laughs> and also selling us expensive stuff Very, which yes. says that they're okay. And so at first it was black men and white women, and now it's black women and white men. Now, mostly the black women are not black women. They are very light skinned and then they do something to their hair, which, um, lets it seem natural, but it is not natural. You can see my hair. <laughs> and, uh, so if when I let my hair grow, it just goes straight up. So if you want your hair to have that shape, which is kind of the shape of your hair, you know, where it comes down and it goes to your shoulders, you have to put a lot of stuff in it. So there's more going on here in the interracial couples that we see. But the point I wanted to make was interracial couples as acceptable as the images of American um, consumerism. Mm 
which I think is something that could not have happened in the 20th century. No, it bursts really when, when Obama is elected. I notice it too. Mm -hmm. And it just, it went from basically no African-Americans in television advertising yeah. to just exactly. Yeah, yeah. So here's a question. Could the reasons for quote unquote lack of resistance to the Lovings case in 1967 have to do with the rise of the TV and the exit of extended families by the leading to breakdown of clannish behavior. Another viewer asked about the, if the dynamic had been reversed, if the pairing were a white woman and a black man, I did not see that question, um, but we've talked about that some. Uh, so what about the role of television? That's really interesting. Yeah. I guess this is this is where we talk about the cultural elites invading the sanctity of you uh -huh. know, households across the country. Um, I don't know about about television. I actually have a a, a really depressing um, partial answer. I think for why people didn't respond so much, and that has to do with white people figuring out that they didn't need laws preventing interracial marriage in order to still benefit from white supremacy. Oh. So, even if you get rid of so many of the legal barriers, um, yes, which uh, they were falling, yeah, sixties, you can uh -huh. still go live in your gated community and send right. your child to your private school, mm -hmm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's one Very reason, which is a different reason. Is you know, does this go off into you know, does this go off into society? And you mm -hmm. do see differences in polling data um, uh -huh. from who who thinks it's okay for people to marry across the color line and who doesn't, and so. Some predictable ones, older people tend to think it's a very bad idea and younger people don't care so much. Um, white evangelical Protestants are still not sold on the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and they stand out as being opposed. Um, African Americans are more in favor, but not, com but not completely um, sure. on, on that. So I think you know, there are a lot of different, different things that mm -hmm. lead to people's feelings today about yeah. possibility. But I think your point about um, the loss of the um, power of the law mm -hmm. to protect whiteness and white supremacy, I think that's a really good point. So how do attitudes toward Native Americans fit into the history that Jane has analyzed? In very complicated ways, mm -hmm. um, and in ways that I don't know as much, as much about. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Mildred Loving yes. uh, in the Loving case is um, they were from a part of a part of Virginia that um, we would we would call um, oh what's it what's it what, people from many different races yeah uh, biracial multiracial yeah, multiracial at least but but Native American and descendants of slaves and mm -hmm. descendants of of white people. Mm -hmm. um, and so Mildred Loving for sure was mixed, mm -hmm. mixed among all of that. But she insisted always on her identity as a Native American uh -huh. um, and did not actually embrace an identity as an African American, uh -huh. despite the way that we remember her. So mm -hmm. it's, it is, it's very complex yeah. uh, in the Eastern, in the Eastern states. Yeah. Uh, do you do you know about questions around around the reservations or states like uh, North and South Dakota? Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, um, Dakota, Mexico. The, the Dakotas had anti miscegenation laws. Um, I again, it depends on how the laws were written. In mm -hmm. if you if you're going to write a law that says, and the way that it tended to be written in the 20th century was. White people can only marry white people, and the rest of you can do whatever you want. Hmm. And that was California's law, and that was why it was it was vulnerable because it was clearly just protecting one group's genes oh, and not the genes of everybody else. Hmm. Um, so that was how a lot of these laws were written in states with large Native American populations. Um, they were almost certainly not able to marry whites, but probably able to marry others. Uh-huh. If that makes uh, sense. Yeah. Um, 
Did the hysteria about interracial sex exist before emancipation? We talked about this some, but uh, since the question has come up, maybe you want to repeat yourself. Yeah. And if not, what is it about emancipation that caused the hysteria to increase? Right. Um, so the quick answer is yes, this is something new. And, and this is something that, that you and other historians have tried to say about the Reconstruction era and the post-Reconstruction era was that some, some things were new then, and this is one of them. So this white hysteria about interracial sex um, was, I don't know if it's manufactured, it's probably not the right word, um, but, but the circumstances in which it arose were ones in which black men were enfranchised in addition to being freed. And so in other words, African-American men were joining the polity they were uh -huh. running for office. They were holding office. Yeah. Uh, they were, you know, they were men and they had the vote. Yeah. And that was the context for the rise of this new, uh, really horrible discourse. Um, I um, discovered a whole new, um, <laughs> whole new category of questions here. Um, could you speak a little, perhaps anecdotally, about 19th century relationships between Southern white women and black men for whom there was a real power disparity in social and legal terms? So I sounds like maybe the, the question, the questioner is wondering if white women abused their power in the same way that white men did. Um, and there is, I don't know if there's evidence of that exactly. Mm -hmm. We know that white women slave owners often, often, we know some, you know more than this, I think, mm -hmm. about this than I do, about how many um, and where do you find these stories? No, we, we can't get good numbers on this. No, yeah. um, but I think, it's, I think it's not, it would be against human nature to assume that white women did not use their power as mistresses mm -hmm. um, in sexual ways. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of thing that probably can be um, most meaningfully approached through fiction rather than history, because we have so little archival evidence. Yes, although I want to throw in actually Martha Hode's book. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, is is really uh, that she she finds those stories and gives us a good story. So you should look for uh, for that book. Oh, here's it's a, it's something interesting. Wasn't the decoding of the genome, as recent as it was, the best refutation of arguments previously raised about the likely harm that would result from intermarriage? Um, if, you, if you believe in science, <laughs> that would be a yes. Yeah. Uh, something I found really interesting um, as I was doing uh, the history of white people uh, a little while back is that very early in this century, um, that is as the genome was uh, being investigated and we discovered how much we all had in common, uh, there, was, there was so much carrying on about how race doesn't make any sense and we're all pretty much the same. And, you know, why do, why do we have these strictures? Because there's only one race, it's the human race. And that was pretty general, um, say 20 years ago. But then around 2005, six, seven, around in there, there was a re-racing of the genome, um, most easily seen in the furor over the, the drug for black hypertension, uh, marketed for black people. It turned out to be a, a drug that already existed. And um, in some cases it did work better for people who identified as black, but it also sometimes worked better for people who didn't. And for a lot of people it didn't work. Um, but the whole question was, how do you decide who's black? And that's a theme that's kind of in many of the questions that are sort of underneath yeah. um, what have, have come in. We've, we've had many questions that use the term, which you also use, 
uh, of interracial. Um, if you were writing now, um, after the summer of 2020, would you use the term interracial? Oh. I mean, uh, that's, as a his, it depends, I guess, on what we're talking, when we're talking about, because mm -hmm. part of the trouble with, with deciding on, on terms is taking our, our language of today back with us yes. into 1890 or, yeah. or 19, yeah. 1910. And yeah. that can be very, very tricky and particularly this kind of scholarship. Yeah, yeah. This, was, this is something that I've been struggling with uh, because in terms of the history of white people, so many Americans want to read one big white race back into um, the early 20th century when it was commonly thought and experts thought there was more than one white race. Right. I'm gonna ask you one last question and um, then we will say goodbye to, uh, this has been a wonderful, uh, wonderfully active audience. Um, what are your thoughts on our election of a black slash Asian woman who is married to a white man to the vice presidency. I just think it's wonderful. Um, she really manages to get so many categories, <laughs> not including including graduate of Howard University, which I also think is a really important part, yes, of, her, uh, part of her biography to throw in there. But I just think it's great. Yeah, and she's a Californian. She and I grew up in the same neighborhood. We're I'm different generation, but in the Timiskel neighborhood of Oakland, right next to Berkeley. Uh, so I know she's a good person in addition to all those other wonderful attributes. Jane, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, here's the book, a terrific book that leads us back to Freud and back to the issues that really stir us on the gut level where so much of our political thinking occurs. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, audience, and uh, thanks to the Brooklyn Library Center, and goodbye. Bye. Yay. Yay, thank you. Thanks, that was terrific. Oh, it's so good to see you. <laughs>